Right, so this is in fiction. This was published by W.W. W. Norton back in, what year was this? I think 2009, 2011, oh, okay. Um, so back in 2011, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what came before hint fiction and what has happened after hint fiction. And then of course talk a little bit about hint fiction. Um, basically in terms of writing, I've always wanted to be a writer ever since like middle school. Um, it was just something, you know, you know, a lot of people know that they want to be astronauts or police or whatever else, I just want to be a writer. Um, but of course, as my parents would tell me, uh, writing is not necessarily a stable profession. Um, you know, you have the big, the big authors out there, but usually there's mid-list writers. And a lot of times when people hear that you're a writer, they think, oh, you know, that's what you must do full time. And a lot of writers I know, a few do write full time. A lot of them know that, you know, that's something that they do kind of on the side. So, uh, you know, in college I would write, you know, I, I wrote some novels and started querying agents and uh, finally was able to get an agent, um, I think in my early 20s. And I thought, okay, that's it. I got an agent. Great. I'm going to sell this novel. You know, it's done. And that's really not how it works. So what happened was uh, the agent, and, then, and this was, and this is how long ago it was. I had to print out ten copies of the novel myself, send it to him to send out to you know physically send the novel to publishers, and then I guess the publishers if they, if they declined would send the you know the manuscript back to the agent. Well, I sound really old now <laughs> because a few years later, um, which I'll get to. Uh, when I switched to agents, you know, that was basically, oh, I'm just going to email to agents. So, I mean, they've completely changed now. Um, so anyway, uh, basically, uh, he had gone out with two different novels. Uh, one was a thriller, one was more of a literary type thing. And uh, there were a lot of good feedback, which seems to be always the case with a lot of uh, rejections that writers get. Uh, it, there was one time where a senior editor of Double Day Publishing, which is a, uh, an imprint of Random House, had called up my agent and said, you know, I love this book. But I don't think it's right for it, for, a, for a double day. And um, it was like, OK. Well, unfortunately, we didn't find any other editor who felt the same way. So uh, you know, that one kind of was set aside, and we would go on to another one. And then for some reason, I don't know if anybody ever watched Entourage. Never ever seen Entourage? It creates this glamorous idea of having like an agent as your best friend. And that's usually not what happens. An agent is basically, they're there to make money. They're there to sell books to, to make money. You almost never hear from them, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, you know, they do. Uh, I've worked with some with some really you know good agents in the past, but there are times where you kind of feel the working relationship is going nowhere. You're spinning your wheels. Um, it's just kind of time to move on. Uh, so I had parted ways with uh, with that agent, and then kind of realized, crap. Now I'm completely agentless. What am I going to do? Because this was. Eight years ago, I think, the only way to really get to a publisher was through an agent. Uh, some agents took, you know, unsolicited manuscripts directly from authors. Not many did. You really needed an agent to do that. So I realized, oh shoot, I fired my agent. And now I need to find another agent. So uh, fortunately, I was able to find another agent uh, pretty quickly with a new novel, and he was really enthusiastic about this novel, and you know, he sent it out to an editor, and it was the whole same type of thing again. In fact, it got to the point where. I was being told from my agent, so and so is going to the publisher directly and talking about them, and they're going to whatever else. And then, like a week later, it's like, no, oh, we still don't hear anything, and you know, just on and on and on. And so, uh, in the midst of all this, I had, you know, I would continue writing short stories. I would write little articles online. One of which was a kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, essay about a thing that I called hint fiction, which was basically about stories that were so so short. That you know, were they considered stories? Who knew? You know, let's say because they're hinting at stuff, let's call them hint fiction. And uh, at the time, I had done a little contest at my website for people to write little short stories of 25 words or less. And um, uh, I was fortunate enough. I don't know if anybody knows the novelist Stuart Nan, but I've known him for a very long time. Um, he actually had judged the contest that I won, so I've known him through that. And that was back almost like how old? Almost 15 years. Ago. Really old. <laughs> so anyway, um, nobody says I feel really young. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> so uh, he was, you know, he was like, sure, I'll, you know, I'll judge this. That sounds fun. Well, having him involved really kind of got the ball rolling in terms of the internet because you never know how the internet works.
course. Sometimes things just become viral and you never really try it, because usually when you do try to make things viral, it never happens. So it just kind of like word just really spread, you know, about this little contest and about this idea of pin fiction. And the second day of the contest, I get an email from an editor at WW Norton, um, who was emailing me and my agent about maybe putting together uh, anthology of these stories. And immediately I called him and said, "Did you just get this email?" And he said, "Yeah. Um, do they want you to have an, a story in an anthology?" I'm like, "No, I think they want me to put together an anthology." So. Uh, Long story short, we put together an anthology, and that is this thing that came out. You know, 2009 was when I did the essay. That was when the whole thing kind of came about. So 2011 is when this was released. It was released in November. Um, got really good reviews in uh, New Yorker, Los Angeles Times. Um, I was interviewed on uh, NPR, Scott Simon. So, you know, the whole... There was a lot of press for this little little book, a little book that could. And you know, it's still being used today in schools, colleges, and uh, it's, it's a fun little thing. So what happened was, after that, um, my agent kind of wanted to wait for my next book to come out so that it would raise my profile. And at the same time, um, e-readers were becoming very popular. Uh, digital publishing was, was getting more and more ground. And a lot of writers that I knew uh, who had always kind of, I don't want to say necessarily been mistreated by their publishers, but who were basically being ignored by their publishers, were kind of starting to go off on their own. And I started kind of experimenting myself in just kind of putting things out there and started having really good um, success with it. Um, because basically what happens is uh, you write a book, say you manage to get an agent, the agent manages to get to get a publisher. Uh, say advances nowadays are going really down. Um, I think right now, five ten thousand dollars is usually the base. Uh, there are a lot, you know, six figure deals that do happen. I know a writer recently who did get one, which is great for him. Um, but usually the base is you know five ten thousand dollars. And what happens is that, that is kind of given out over the course of a year or two. Usually like. Half of the advance is given on signing the contract. The other half is given once you turn in the full manuscript. Sometimes it's, it's split up into thirds, where then when the book actually comes out, you get the remainder of the advance. Um, and then to actually earn back or recoup that advance and then start earning royalties sometimes almost never happens. But when it does happen, you get paid every six months. I mean, the whole accounting aspect of publishing is very interesting. So, um, Basically, I had uh, you know talked to my agent, kind of saying, you know, do you mind if I start you know doing things on my own? And he's like, no, no, no that, that's you know that's fine. So I started just putting some stuff out because I had all these books that had gone out to publishers, that had gotten great feedback from publishers that just um, I guess the best way to explain it is back in the day, editors kind of had final say over what books got published. And they would see a book, they'd say, I want to publish that book, it gets published. Nowadays, it's a little bit different. An editor can have strong feelings towards a book, but who has the final say almost always is the marketing department. They take it to the marketing department, and then they're able to say, okay, are there any books like this that have been published in the past so many years? If so, how did those books do? How many copies did those books move? You know, they basically always come up with how many copies can we sell, because quite honestly, publishing is a business. So, um, a lot of times, that's why some good books just don't get published because they they figure, okay, you know, a book like this came out and only sold 2,000 copies, we're not going to bother with it. So um, that was something else that you know a lot of writers get up against. Uh, so I had had a lot of books just basically sitting in a metaphorical drawer, which really is on my computer, that was just sitting there. And I thought, okay, well, you know, now there's an option to basically put them out there myself because. The distribution model of digital publishing is on par with what a major publisher can offer. Uh, in bookstores, no. Uh, that's a whole nother, how much time do we have? I guess I can go on this for a long time. Uh, okay, so the distribution model. So say for hit fiction. So um, basically the production for this was, I believe, 2009, they did the deal. In 2010 was when we were able to get everything put together. It's about usually six months to a year by the time, once you turn in the final manuscript, to when the actual book is printed. And what happens then is 
they have um, reps. Norton would have reps that would go out to bookstores, a lot of times independent bookstores, but also they have reps that meet with Barnes & Noble, Borders when Borders was around. And they would talk about the books that were coming up, you know, in the fall season, the winter season, or whatever else. And basically bookstores would say, okay, you know, we'll take 10 copies, we'll take 100 copies, we'll take however many copies. And that's usually, you know, the initial print run um, goes from there. Publishers, when they pay a lot of money for books, uh, they do a thing called co-op space, where they're basically paying a bookstore X amount of dollars to, like when you walk into a Barnes & Noble and there is that table there that says new releases, those books are out there randomly. Those books are there because the publisher paid Barnes & Noble to have those books there, and they're usually been there for about a week or so. Because every week, more and more books are being published and are being on shelf space. And the thing about, about shelf space in bookstores is it stays static. Except for Barnes Noble. I was in a Barnes Noble recently, and it seems like they lost a lot of section of the books to add more toys and whatever else. So they're even losing shelf space. Um, so basically then, this had come out. Um, you know, we did a little mini tour. I went to uh, Los Angeles, New York, uh, with, you know, had the contributors who were in the areas come out to different bookstores. Uh, if anybody's familiar with New York City, there's an independent bookstore called McNally Jackson, which is a really great independent bookstore. Uh, we had a, we had a, uh, a reading there. Um, in November of 2011 and a couple months later I was back up in New York for a reading at a different location and I decided okay you know what I'm gonna swing by McDonald Jackson's great bookstore and while I'm there I'm like oh you know what I'm gonna see if they have any copies of Hinge Fiction and they didn't <laughs> and I kind of realized oh wait you know what that, that's right a book really only has maybe a couple weeks shelf life you know unless you're James Patterson Stephen King Daniel Steele that's because um, that publisher prints hundreds of thousands of copies as opposed to most novels or most books where only get, you know, the print run is very small. And you only have a couple weeks to really sell books, otherwise they lose their space. So for me, thinking about more of the long term, I thought, well, in that case, what happens after those several months go by? Where are people going to buy copies of the book, if, it, you know, if they buy copies of the book at all? Well, the answer was obviously online. Most, most um, notably, would probably be Amazon. So um, I decided, okay, well, you know what? I'm just going to try to play around with that. And um, so, you know, started basically uh, going direct. Um, the way the way publishing, if I'm talking too quickly, or if I'm boring anybody, just let me know. I can switch gears. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to keep, uh, keep this going at a normal progression. Um, Publishing contracts are typically set up into percentage wise. So it's kind of like a boilerplate uh, uh, contract where you, a certain percentages for ebooks. Since 10 years ago, or however much when they came up with ebooks, it was mostly a 25% royalty that you would get um, once you know stuff would earn out. Uh, what happened was when the Kindle started becoming very popular, Amazon, because they basically wanted to try to steal writers away from their publishers, started offering, um, actually, you know what, they didn't do it at first. They started making it uh, possible to publish directly through Amazon. And I think it was actually a smaller role, I think it was 35%. Once Apple really started getting into the game, they were offering uh, what's called an agency model, which is 70% royalty to the writer, 30% to the platform. And then Amazon matched that. And then you know, Barnes Noble comes along, Kobo comes along, Google Play comes along, and they basically open up their doors to anybody who wants to go direct. So they're offering these huge percentages that really compete with, with just you know, a major publisher. And so a lot of writers that I knew, again, that, uh, that I mentioned before, who kind of were necessarily either dropped from their publisher or they weren't able to you know, get much money out of their publisher, decided to kind of go the direct route. And a lot of them started having a lot of success. Uh, myself, to date, I've sold over 150,000 uh, ebooks, um, mostly because the distribution model is the exact same as every other book that's published. Um, James Pat, like, um, in terms of paperback sales, I would never, ever be able to match. Uh, a distribution of, like, say, Stephen King. There's just no way. His publisher is going to publish, you know, 100,000 copies of his book, probably even more. Um, but when it comes to digital, it's a level playing field. And that's what a lot of writers started realizing. And not only that, then, 
there's a thing called, um, oh man, now I'm drawing blank. Uh, basically, when you print a book, you know, there's the production cost. There is sometimes the storage. Where are you going to store it? How much, you know, uh, it costs a lot of money to ship. I shipped a book the other day, I think it was to the UK, and the shipping alone was more than the book cost. Yeah. It's insane. <laughs> so, uh, the thing though with ebooks is basically there are no overhead costs besides the initial cost of, you know, the editing, formatting, cover art, design, which a little kind of a fun fact, a lot of publishers outsource editing, formatting, um, just the graphic uh, art. Uh, this was the hint fiction that Norton did on the copyright page, even has in here, I think it's on the back, cover design by, you know, some other, just some other company. It wasn't actually anybody in-house who was doing it. The same thing with the layout. Yep, book designed by Judith Stagnito. So, Basically, what happens is publishers, you know, when they acquire a book, um, you know, they sometimes do have their own in-house team that does the co the the, uh, the cover art, that does do the editing, that does do the layout. Nine times out of ten, though, they will just um, outsource it. You know, they'll pay a cover artist a set amount of dollars. They'll, they'll pay someone to format the book, and these are all just kind of fixed costs. You know, one-time costs. And a lot of writers started realizing, well, we can do the same exact thing. And then once we earn back that money, all the royalties come to us, as opposed to paying basically a professional royalty for the distribution model um, going through a normal publisher. So, um, yeah. Uh, now, don't, uh, don't get me wrong. I know there's sometimes, there's a lot of conflict out there about some writers are very either pro doing it yourself, the wholesale publishing route, or pro uh, traditional publishing. Um, I'm kind of in the middle, you know, I kind of feel whatever, whatever writers want to do, that is their business. Um, I just think it's really good to kind of be aware of all the different options that are out there. To kind of be aware, and you know, as long as you're aware of all the options out there and you're able to make an uh, educated decision, then, you know, the more the merrier. But a lot of times there just seems to be a lot of white noise involved in, you know, a lot of people just yelling back and forth. There's a whole thing going on right now about Amazon and shit publishing. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. Apparently it's, you know, they're trying to deal, uh, Hachette is one of the major publishers out there. They publish uh, Little Brown as one of their imprints. They do like James Patterson, um, all of his novels. And apparently, you know, the, the negotiations have broke down and some authors have come out saying that Amazon's being a bully. Well, meanwhile, Amazon and Simon Schuster, another publisher, were able to make a deal pretty quickly. So, who knows what's going on? Um, so, uh, yeah, in terms of, uh, let me see here. This is my one title. This one I did actually hit the USA Today bestseller list. Um, uh, it's called The Serial Killer's Wife. Uh, this is a book that. I think how many copies have sold so far. Basically, let me talk about the design. Uh, the cover art itself, um, I was able to, it's actually the second type of cover art I got for it. Um, there's just graphic designers out there. There's one guy, there's one gentleman I was able to uh, be in contact with. He's designed several of my covers. He's really, really good. Um, He's in New Zealand, and basically, uh, he would read the book, or we would talk about the book. You know, I was able actually for this for, for this variation, I found the image of uh, the woman's face, and I told him like, you know, I want to include this image somewhere, um, and he came up with this really cool cover. Uh, basically, once you know, and I paid him um, uh, X amount of dollars. Once I earn that money back, it's basically pure profit from that, which. You know, I don't know. It's it's really incredible if you think about it. Because back in the day, there was really no such thing as pure profit. There was, you know, again, you only had the one option going through a publisher. Uh, you know, getting a very very small percentage of royalties, if any royalties, again, if your advance earns out. So uh, yeah, I mean, basically, it's gotten to the point now where every day I sell copies of this book, and you know, it's pure, it's pure profit. So there are some books that take longer to earn out, you know, to earn back my initial investment than others. Um, and I'm constantly, uh, you know, doing promotions. Uh, there's a lot of uh, 
some really smart business people came out, uh, once, especially once ebooks started, uh, and they kind of created these lists, these email lists, where people could subscribe to these email lists, and every day they would get an email showing you know, these, these discounted ebooks. And this one company, I think they recently got some financing, several million dollars, because they've grown this list to like over, I think, almost two million subscribers. And it's kind of like a magazine. The more subscribers they have, the more they can charge for advertising. So actually, when I did a promotion for this novel, I used that, that one ebook uh, e list, and that was how I was able to get on the USA Today bestseller list. Uh, just because they were able to sell, I think, within a week, I sold over five, 6,000 copies. Um, now, a lot of people were going to say, like, oh, wow, five, 6,000 people are going to read your book. That's not necessarily the case. I'm sure everyone here has bought books that you've had for years and never read. So, I mean, just because you sell copies doesn't necessarily mean people are actually going to read copies. Of course, you want people to read the copies, but um, there's that always to take into consideration as well. Robert, could you maybe talk for a minute in terms of your personal aesthetic? What would you rather have, people buy your book or read your book? It's tough. <laughs> because, because uh, you know, is, could, could I have both? <laughs> if you couldn't, if well, you could only have one. I, I will admit that... Um, you know, if I have to choose between being an artist and being a business person, I'd rather make money. Maybe watch a Shark Tank. I feel like I'm like Kevin. You know, I just want to make money. <laughs> Mr. Wonderful. Mr. Wonderful. Mr. Wonderful. Mr. Wonderful. That's right. Um, no, I mean, I love getting emails from people. You know, um, what's what's really funny is I will have people email me. Um, say I do do a promotion, and someone from Australia will email me and be like, "Well, this wasn't on sale," and they'll say, and I've actually had this. They like, you know, is that an issue with your publisher? Because they don't know. They don't know that basically the, the majority of my stuff I do myself because I take great care and to make sure that it's a professional product, that you know it's edited well, it's proofread well, that I do everything a major publisher does, um, you know, that I basically match it. So to anybody who's just you know encountering the book on either Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, wherever else, you know. No one really knows Random House, Simon Schuster, you know, majority of readers. Um, if you're a writer, you probably have a better idea because you're aware of that type of thing. I know this shows just how much of a, of a writer geek I am. Um, there have been times where uh, I would just walk around Barnes & Noble and, you know, look, look at books. You know, I, I, I could tell you uh, what author was published by what house, who their agent or editor was, um, it's kind of like you know how people know like uh, baseball, uh, <laughs> st st yeah, statistics. It was kind of like the same thing, you know. I knew like with Stephen King, like, oh, well, his first couple books was with Doubleday, and then he moved to, you know, like, you know, it's just kind of like you know useless information. But uh, so you know, obviously, you know, when a, when a novel's published, I I look at who the publisher is just because I've gotten to that mindset. I just you know I just immediately look at it. It's not that I'm looking out there on purpose. It's just I just happen to to look for it. Uh, but most readers don't. Most readers just kind of see a book, if it interests them, you know, they, the great thing about online right now is you can, you know, sample the first 10%, 20% of a book before you buy it. Um, so, you know, that they, they read it, they, they, they like it, and they buy it. And, um, yeah. Um, but in terms of people reading or buying it, yeah, that probably go with buying. That's a little bit more. Because at least when they buy it, then there's always a chance of them reading it. Um, I know online piracy is a big issue. I never, re I don't know. I kind of feel, um, I think, I don't know if it was Corey Doctorow who said it, and maybe it was Neil Gaiman. Someone said along the lines of um, uh, the greatest, the greatest fear a writer has is obscurity or something along the lines. I mean, basically the idea of you know, being a writer and no one even knowing you exist or even reading your work. So in terms of online piracy, it's on there, whatever. You know, I figure if people are going to go to a pirate site, they're not going to buy the book anyway. I know a lot of writer friends of mine will go crazy when they find their stuff on pirate sites. They'll send, um, uh, what, are, what are they called, the DCMAs, is that it? So, you know, they'll, they'll go crazy, and I'm just like, whatever. I know, do, I do know Neil Gaiman, anybody familiar with Neil Gaiman? Insanely huge author. Um, Basically, there were times where he found that piracy actually helped his work. You know, when he gave away his work, his sales increased. So, you know, to each his own. Um, time is it? 
to our 430. Are there any questions or comments so far? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, we can go ahead and open it up to questions. And if any of you have you know, questions both about uh, you know, business acumen in publishing, or if you just want to ask Robert some craft questions about writing, we can just sort of open it up and do that. One thing I do want to mention real quick, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, one, the, the one nice thing, though, about um, kind of just be doing it myself, with like hit fiction, um, basically when this first came out, you know, I had a publicist that I worked with, and uh, again, you know, we, I was on NPR with Scott Simon, which was really cool. We went into the studio, we recorded that. Excuse me. Um, basically, a month or so after the book comes out, you never really hear from the publicist again. You never really hear from your publisher again because they move on to so many other books. Um, I mean, if it's a huge success, yes, it's a little bit different. But again, that's that window for success is so tight. What happens usually is publishers will publish 20 books, hoping at least one is a huge success. And typically, that, that's what happens. But they just kind of throw the books out there, hoping that one of them becomes big. Um, one that comes to mind, I think, was uh, The Kite Runner, which came out a long time ago. Did anyone read that or hear of it? That guy actually started out writing short stories in the horror small press. I was even in an anthology with him. Um, but then he kind of came out with his book, and it just took off. I can guarantee you that when the publisher first released it, I don't think they expected it to be as big as it eventually became. That's one of the successes, I mean, where they, you know, they throw out books and they hope that one of them becomes a huge success. And he is doing extremely well now because of it. Um, but the nice thing, at least, you know, kind of making it all on my own shoulders is... You know, these are my babies. You know, I love them all uh, equally, and so it means is that a book that came out, you know, three years ago, I, I, I still wanted to continue to succeed. So I'll do whatever I can to kind of have that, you know, succeed. Um, so I'm very, very involved. Again, um, in terms of like cover art, this is a short story collection that I put together, and I mentioned uh, the guy who is down in New Zealand. I, I gave him this image, uh, and I said, you know, I can kind of give him an idea of what I wanted to do with it. And then I told him, you know, for the paperback, could, if, if we can make it so that, like, you're looking through the image and you can see the words, and it took him a long time to come up with it, but it's one of those things that we were able to do, and I don't think they really would have taken the time with a traditional publisher to do, especially for a short story collection, because short story collections, historically, not so well at all. Um, I think even T.C. Boyle, I mean, I'm sure he sells a lot, but even his books, probably his short story collections don't sell that well. But, yeah, I mean, I mean he did... Like, if you notice, here's a little S, he gets a little bit down there, so I don't know. That was a really kind of neat thing that we were able to do. And, you know, you talk about being re uh, reading or selling books. It's one of those things where it is more an artistic choice. Because, quite honestly, how many paperback copies of this am I going to sell? <laughs> you know, there's going to be so much more ebooks as opposed to paperback. But still, it's like you want to do something really kind of neat for the... Um, for, in fact, you got my next novel, the New, New Avalon. Avalon. New Avalon. Yeah. And, I mean, obviously, there's going to be stuff still in the back that's not complete, but you saw the wraparound on that cover. And it's, it's really, really sharp. And it's and it's it's interesting too. One of the things that I noticed about it, and I would I would encourage all of you to check this book out. I, I've started reading it, and it's really interesting. It's a novel that's written in the second person, which is really rare in the first place, and it manages to keep that energy alive. But one of the things that's interesting is most books. Uh, are like 6 by 8 or like uh, an 11 by 17 or a 10 by 8 and New Avalon is this very thin novel. What is it like? A 4 it's by actually, 8? It's actually a uh, 5 by 8. It's about this size. I wanted to do a little bit smaller but I wasn't able to. It's not thinner? No. It must be just the art that's on it then. Something about it Something felt about thinner. It does it, yeah. and, it's, and, on the ins and maybe because it's the ARC. I don't know but but the text, you know, like here. Well, the text I was experimenting with, I'm actually going to, I'm, I'm going to widen those margins out a little bit. I, I think it's a little bit. There's something I, cool about it. And like here, you know I'm how the experiment. margins are this big? In his book, they're like this. So the reading experience is, is quicker. You know, it's, it's different than, than what you might I think the font get. is too small, though. That, that's the thing. I want to kind of make the font a little bit bigger. I'm experimenting with it. But this have, is... I still have, I think, three weeks before it gets released. So I have. That's another thing, too, where I can go up until the wire before release, before making my changes, as opposed to with, like, oh, oh, I have a good story. <laughs> uh, so, Hit Fiction. We had come up with, they had come up with this really cool cover idea where they basically had these, like, three uh, Hit Fiction pieces. And then throughout there, they had, you know, the title, uh, the subtitle, and my byline. 
And what happened was, this was a third printing. Is that one the one he gave you? Can I see that real quick? Is this? That's the second printing. Well, anyway, on the first printing, they they had come up with a certain type of cover, and there was, I forget what it was exactly, there was one of the stories, but one that kind of changed a little bit. And they said, okay, fine. And turns out, they sent the wrong files in. So the very first book actually has a slightly different cover than the, than the, uh, than the printings that came after it. The same thing with the copyright page. The only page that I did not proof, they, they misspelled my name. And what happened, well, I, they actually spelled James Fry's name wrong, too. And um, basically, it was like six months out before the book was even supposed to be printed. But because this, the files had been submitted, there's nothing they could do about it. It's like, really? So that's a little fun fact, too. As opposed to, you know, say something happens where I decide to uh, change whatever else, I can, I can, you know, within a day. The, those changes can already be up and running. So there is a lot of more uh, immediacy in, in terms of basically having more of a uh, control, especially when we, come, when we want to talk about IP or intellectual property. Because when you're selling a book to a publisher, what you're really doing is you're kind of just leasing it in a way. You know, you're basically granting them the rights to publish it for an extended amount of time. Sometimes it's for the amount of the copyright, and that's why you really need to have a good agent to get in there to negotiate to make sure you aren't signing your rights away. Because a copyright is basically the life of you, plus, was it 73 years? So, uh, and back in the day, before there was ebooks, usually when a book went out of print, the rights reverted back to the author. Well, now, because of digital publishing, when does an ebook go out of print? So that's one, another thing that a lot of writers kind of take into consideration when they're you know, signing these contracts. Um, because, you know, say, you know, I have some books that every day, you know, they might earn me $10, $20 just themselves. Well, add it up over the course of 10 years if it continues that way. That really adds up, um, you know, a little bit here and there. So, you know, that's one of the things a lot of writers also take into consideration. Uh, but before I talk about that, Jesse, you were saying something. Well, well, I was just going to say, why don't why don't we go ahead time wise? Why don't we open it up to questions and see if yeah, yeah, yeah. see if some some folks have anything they'd like to ask? Any questions? You just make stuff up. It's fine. Um, I have a question about well, we've had experience with both physical books and with ebooks. Yes. Do you feel like there is like I'm not sure how to quite how to describe it, but like a like different feeling when you have an ebook versus when you have the physical copy? Uh, in terms of as a reader or as a writer? As a writer. Um, personally, it doesn't matter to me. I, maybe it was because the hand fiction thing came out previously before I really decided to get into involved in the whole digital thing where I kind of maybe got that out of my system. Because mm -hmm. it was kind of cool, like, oh, wow, well, you know, this whole thing happened. And it was kind of like, OK, that happened. Um, and then I kind of, you know, I've been involved on the outside and on the inside of just publishing for, you know, ever since high school, I was kind of like staying up with stuff. So I've become very disillusioned over the years. You know, like that whole, the whole great thing about selling a novel and all this stuff, whatever else. Like I've become very realistic about certain aspects of publishing, um, especially nowadays, you know, with, with more and more bookstores closing and everything else. Um, as a reader, I actually start preferring ebooks more just because I feel like it's more convenient. You know, wherever I am, I can sync it. You know, I can sync it on my phone. I can sync it on my Kindle, or whatever else. It's easier to just have as opposed to like you know, an 800-page hardcover that I can like lug around. Um, I try to go back and forth between them. Um, also, recently I had moved, so I know that having books is awful. Yes. <laughs> I had to get rid of so many books initially, and that's on top of all the books I kept, which I still kept a lot of books. You know, it's nice having them in a cloud. At the same time, though. When you're buying an ebook, you're really licensing it. You know, um, some places you're actually able. You know, they have digital rights management where you're able to actually own that copy of your book. Most times, like with you know Apple, you know, when you buy music through Apple, you're basically you know, it's it, it's connected to your your Apple account, it's connected to your Amazon account. You're not really owning it so much as it's there to access whenever you would like it. 
Um, and then that's one reason I think why a lot of writers who kind of go the more independent route, they do price their books just a little bit cheaper because they don't have that overhead. You know, um, with 70% royalties most times, you know, for like a 4.99 book, I can make like over $3 per unit sold. Um, so going any higher would almost seem like I'm ripping people off. I mean, I'm trying it. New Avalon, I think I'm going to price a 5.99 to kind of experiment because it's a different type of novel. But I mean, sometimes like you know, pricing at 9.99 just seems like, you know, that just does not seem right. I will, you know, I, I won't feel right doing that. <laughs> Although it's a nice royalty, I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, but yeah, in terms of, I mean, the only reason I make the books in print is because I know some people do like you know physical copies. Um, but you know, for me personally, um, mostly because there's no there's more there's more overhead with this. And then my other question was, um, when it comes to getting a physical copy of a self-published book, yes. what's the process like of actually getting the phys the physical pages, the printing, the so there's a lot of different services out there. Um, the and, distribu the, and distribution. The printers have come a long way with print-on-demand technology. Years ago, it was really crappy stuff. But um, these, it's uh, you know, I mean, they have really come a long way. Like, like I said, they the quality of the paper, the quality of the covers, everything else um, is almost on par, I would say, with just you know books that are pub that are published. Because basically, when a publisher publishes a book. Um, they publish probably you know, 10,000 copies. You know, the more copies they publish, the cheaper it's going to cost. You know, obviously per copy sold. But what happens then is that they're stuck with 10,000 some copies. You know, they haven't had a warehouse, whatever else. With print on demand technology, it's like I said, it's print on demand. You order a copy, they print it, and they mail it to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, for this, you know, there's a lightning source, there's Create Space. Um, basically, you would upload a file. Uh, it's you know. And you can just order like, like a, a proof copy, or you can order your own copies, or whatever else. Uh, within a week, usually they're sent to you. And but like making sure that it turns out all right, that's your responsibility. Oh yeah. Uh, usually, you know, I'll I will um, I order a proof copy myself before I actually make it available for the public. Mm -hmm. You know, I will make sure you know everything looks good. I mean, there are times where I think one time I don't have it here. I have this really, I think I give you a copy of called Phantom Energy. It's a really, really small um, flash fiction collection, really, really small type of thing. Somehow, the cover file that went through, they were reading it wrong, and it was like, it was really bad. But we were able to, to, to fix it, we were able to kind of clean it up, and you know, it was good to go. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely my responsibility to make sure everything uh, would look good, especially like in terms of interior, you know, there aren't any types of issues. Uh, once it is ready to go, um, easily gets distributed to Amazon, Mars Mobile, Ingram. Um, theoretically, you could go into like an independent bookstore and ask them, and they would order it. Mm -hmm. The problem is, a lot of independent bookstores hate writers like me um, because down in Lid I used to live in Lidditz, so uh, there's an independent bookstore down in Lidditz that, when this was released, they did a little kind of special release party. And they went all out. Yeah, they had wine and cheese and whatever else. And there were some, some uh, contributors from the area came, and uh, you know they really loved it, and we got along, and everything was great. And then recently, and th and then I started kind of like doing things my myself. And when they found out about it, it was like I became, you know, no longer welcome there. <laughs> it was like I was like betraying you got them. Blacklisted from yeah, yeah. Basically, it was like I was betraying them because you know, um, especially because I was using Create Space, which is on my Amazon. So, you know, it, that happens, you know. I mean, you know, I love independent bookstores, but at the same time, what are you going to do? They don't always love you. <laughs> That's true. They don't always love you. So, but uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. So, and when it comes down to, like, self-publishing, um, I always say, because um, there were times where I was at the Writer's Digest conference a couple of months ago, and I was talking to somebody um, on a panel, and... Basically, just because you can, I mean, easily anyone here could go home and publish something through Amazon, through Amazon, through Kobo, through wherever else. The question is, should you? And probably not. At least, at least not right away. You know, um, I'm always, you know, help. You know, I get emails from writers asking me questions, and I always try to encourage them. Again, to kind of think, you know, both uh, both terms of traditional and self-publishing. And if they want to do self-publishing, I always, you know, try to give them the reality of certain things. You know, 
uh, how much work it's going to take, you know, because it is hard work. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I kind of feel then, um, because I'm so much more invested, because it is my book, you know, I don't mind putting in the extra time for it. Um, especially because once I put in the extra time, then usually that's it. I don't have to worry about it, you know, it, it, it's there. Um, but, I mean, again, I put in a lot of work, a lot of writers that I know, I mean, they take it extremely serious, because it is a business, you know, I mean, they, you know, because we become our own brands, and, you know, um, I wouldn't want to put out a book that had, it had, like, typos everywhere, that was just a really awful book, because, you know, if someone reads that, then they're not going to read any of my other stuff. So it really becomes a business. It really becomes something that um, that we really take seriously. Now, are there people out there who put out bad stuff? Yes. A lot of times, some a lot of major writers will come and attack more self-published writers because of the really bad stuff. And um, you know what? It is what it is. 